Thank you so much for um, the invitation. I'm really, really thrilled to be here today. Um, and when when Blessing asked me, of course, Blessing is the current um, uh, Standard Bank Young Artist Award winner for visual arts. Um, so it it was almost um, beyond just um, a, a call of duty being, you know, um, a Standard Bank employee, but also because I really do admire. Um, the work that he's doing, um, particularly around this this uh, this prize, because I think um, for a young artist to want to pay pay it forward um, so soon in his his, his career and as he's he's going along and also growing um, is really really commendable um, to want to to open up you know the space to to other younger um, up and coming artists. So with with that, um, I think I will start. Um, I'm sure all of you uh, know who's, who's sitting up here. So I don't want to um, waste too much time by reading their, their, their bios. Um, and, but, but I think uh, how I've kind of structured this moderation is that um, they can each kind of um, give you a sense of who they are um, and how they have um, walked this journey in, in each of their trajectories. Because of course, I think all of you have had a, a very different trajectory to how um, you, you are where you are right now um, as, as established artists, you know. And so, so I'll start with um, the first. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with just a, a general, I think, um, question that each of you can can respond to, um, which is around that, around you know how. You've each had a very different trajectory in how you've come into the art scene, but more so, maybe speak about what was that moment of when you decided, I'm going to become an artist. <laughs> so anyone can start. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. What was the moment? Mm. Am I there? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a nice one. To me, that moment was when, first, I didn't want to be a visual artist. I actually wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a musician. Out of laziness, I wanted a shortcut. I found myself being held in the Eastern Cape. I was like, um, not allowed to have children. Because my father is supporter of the church. Come here, I was going to economically trouble his mom and sister as a stepbrother. Said no, stay with us. Uh, that is this family. His proposition was not even a proposition. What he was persuading me to become was to be a musician, which was the the tree of top to the Eastern Cape at that time. Well, I was a teacher. I, I left for a boy called a policeman, and the trust I produced lots of teachers. They said, just become a teacher and make money, and you'll be good. I said no. Because I could not stand being the same people, uh, so confirming the same people I was when I was going to school. And when I was doing my matric, I wanted to be a musician, go to the University of Natal. One of the found me a prospectus, and when I saw the period was going to take four years, I said, hell no. Johannesburg is the place to be. Just find a band and just do a shortcut. And it's when I was in Johannesburg trying to pursue that, I realized that actually music is like crap, because it's my friends were already in the industry where most times they didn't have money to pay rent nor money for food. <laughs> I was staying with my aunt in Cambridge saying, aunt, I don't think I'm doing that thing because there's no money. And um, it was there, thanks to a wonderful friend of mine from Cape Town. Museum. And 1999 said, no, I'm going to sit for the entry exam for Best Tech. Are you in? Are you out? I said, no, I 
want to do it this year, and I'm just doing this at the good time and going. I said, okay, if you want to do that, you can do that, but it's important that we go and become artists so that we're not standing here have free coffee and biscuits. So the artist person was wearing was nice. There was food. It was like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from his motivation, his own motivation, it motivated me that let me just go. We sat there. We both got accepted, and that's how the project started. And actually, also the 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 decision really was also pushed by a man. I forgot his name. Who was an artist and he was a boy. Googles. He saw one of them, and at times I forget them live on the table. So one day he came to me and said, Son, do not think that I look down on you, on you, I don't wish you well. Having coffee, you do your own thing. You do not belong here. You may become an engineer, but in un in in age and happy. And that was the first man and also I'm talking like that. Mm -hmm. So that's when it that was it. I'm doing it. And I'm in the sky. How wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Mindy first? <laughs> well, I guess for me it was a bit of a roundabout in many ways because it wasn't my intention or my thought to become an artist. Uh, I was interested in science, forensics. I was really good at maths at the time. Um, and my thought was that I'd be a forensic scientist. Uh, so I moved to Cape Town and started uh, my first sort of section of university at Stellenbosch because they had a very good forensics department. Um, and then I think there's just still too many dead people. And so, <laughs> so, so I think, you know, that, that whole space of death and, and, um, and not really knowing what to do with it yeah. uh, made me change my mind. Um, and then I was lucky because at school I had um, the opportunity to do art in the form of pick. So I had that big portfolio that I then sent to the University of Cape Town and they accepted me. Um, and, you know, initially I really didn't have a clear plan. It was just uh, a kind of change of career. My parents had a big freak out about that. Mm -hmm. Role models or anybody that I was um, kind of bouncing ideas off at the time. So luckily I worked under Graham Alexander, who was really helpful and amazing. Um, and then I think that interest in chemical process and organic material and trying to capture the space between life and death kind of came back um, when I started making the work in cowhide. Um, and even then, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to be an artist, really. I wasn't even sure that I would make it, actually, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and then I met Nicholas. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's an interesting place when I was asked by him to give the speech for his Sonic Bank show. Um, it gave an encouragement and, and um, a way forward around looking at somebody who has been successful in their own way around this. Look at Jan, I was so in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> I still am, though. <laughs> but, um, so, so just having somebody to look up to, yeah. you know, um, somebody who's not too much older than me, but at the same time has had a very successful space in mm. um, his art career at that time. And then, you know, being humbled by the fact that he asked me to do the thing for him. Yeah. You know, I was still a student at the time. Um, and so that was one of the moments for me that were very important. Um, and then also just being a young student and, and having gallerists come into the studio, that was an encouraging thing uh, while I was still at Michaelis. Um, and, and having that interest, either be from the National Gallery or from specific galleries themselves, um, I think those moments for me helped kind of make concrete the yeah. space that perhaps I should make it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Firstly, I would just like to say that Nandita Nkambo was my lecturer. <laughs> You're giving away my age. Um, <laughs> and that the first people I ever studied when I first went into fine arts was Nicholas Flobu mm -hmm. and um, Moholi. And I'm just very blessed.
supposed to be on this planet and then feel very like life has come full circle for me. For me, I was born with it um, in terms of I always knew that's what I wanted to do. And the first feeling I had was when my father used to sh show me Zorro. And so I knew that if you draw on walls, parents get angry. And so if you go into my parents' house to this day, underneath everything, like underneath the walls, the walls, in, the walls, in the underneath objects, objects, there's the Zs, like, like everywhere. everywhere. Like, <laughs> like, you know how Zorro did the Z? Um, but, but I, I think, think the most concrete turn in my artistic, artistic career was when I was about nine years, or about eight or nine years old, and I was in a very staunch Afrikaner school called Swans Lake, and um, a teacher called Yathro Dikkeria told my mother that, you know, Laura asks weird things, we really think that it's unfair for her to be in a school where we don't offer art. And then she told my mother about a place called Frank Gibbet Art and Design Center, formerly known as. At the moment, it's called the Peter Clark Art and Design Center in Cape Town. And I started going there from the age of eight. And I went there about three times a week after school. Um, and I met people. Firstly, I met people of color because I was in a white Afrikaner school. Um, and I met people who loved art like me. I met other people who were left-handed like me. And it made me feel like maybe there's these other people in the world that are like me. And the only reason I don't see it is because I'm in this very weird place where everyone's parent is a warden at Paulsmoor. And so I started going there after school and I started meeting people. I met Manfred Ziller when I was 11 years old in a cupboard in, in the art school. And then I, um, I just started figuring out that maybe there's another world where this thing could really happen. And so nothing deterred me from it. Not my grandparents who told me that I have to become a teacher. Oh, yeah, how is it I didn't do that? So everybody always wants to be a teacher. And I think it's a very noble thing to do. But I just think that I like nice things and you can't afford nice things when you're a teacher. And my parents, my mother's a teacher, my father's a lawyer, but they are both people that passionately draw they love drawing, and my, my mother, my mother taught, me taught me, because we used to fight a lot because we were very similar. So when I was about 12 years old, she started taking me to these the color classes, color classes with lots of housewives who were um, white women, and we were the only little brown people in that art class. And I remember feeling very connected to my mother for the first time in a very long time. And now that I'm older, I realize that watercolors is actually something very difficult to actually master. And um, I also realized that me and my mom double team race ward lots of those women <laughs> while I was small. And so I think for me, art has always been a thing of resistance and to prove to other people that I can resist, I can do this thing. And so that's when I wanted to be an artist, when I went to Frankie Bear and met other people who were like me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome to this talk. I think it's an interesting talk because I have a different background. Um, how I fell in love with art was being a child um, who happened to cross the authority and then find yourself, find himself imprisoned. So during that time, I, you know, it's like boring, you know, sitting the whole day doing nothing. So I started sketching my inmates you know, doing their portraits, um, designing uh, birthday cards for their families, you know, writing little, little message, broken message, they're saying. It was, it was interesting because I was doing what I liked that moment. I think that time is when uh, my art thing started to manifest because I gained respect from other, in other inmates, you know, because I, I, was, I was always isolated myself, you know, in my little corner, drawing things around, you know, I even dig, yeah, dig I think, I think I have that drawing of my uh, scaffold where I was sleeping, you know, with the with Tupac picture on the corner. So people, they like, you know, that uh, the way I was doing it, you know, because they were like, oh, you guy, you can place things, you know, that are not in order to order, you know, all those kind of things. Um, then I joined um, a project called Suha Art Project, which when I walked in, the, the teacher was facilitating that project. So the talent to me, and then like in me, and then like, hey, can I make you my assistant? So I, 
assisted the guy, you know, from time to time. And then during that time, then we, we applied to get uh, proper material, which was more of like fabric paints, because the, the, the oil paints would, you know, they, they know you end up getting drunk there, you know. So, yeah, so we, you know, Gothic art. So we used to draw on fabric and then, yeah, and then I did different portraits for different artists. They would pay me like uh, to design a birthday card, maybe seven rand, or sometimes four rand depends, or two rand depends. And then uh, the expensive uh, portrait that I did of uh, this guy from, you know, who was, who was dealing with a lot of stuff around the country, then he got arrested, and then he, I did a portrait of his family, like three of them, so he paid me like 70 rand. Um, and then through accumulating those small monies, and then I, I eventually managed to buy my own uh, sneaker, which was an all star. You know. Then I was like, oh, this is a great inspiration. In this small space, what about when I go outside where I can, even though you know, I still dream of Cape to Cairo, but if I'm in that space, then I can do bigger stuff. You know. So when I came outside, we, like, I, we entered for different uh, competition with different prisoners where the prisons where we I accumulated few of certificates, awards during that time. One of it, I think I was 10 days outside. I went to attend and I got that award as well while I was I was under parole, you know, thing. Then, yeah, during that time, I realized that hey, there's something skew about this so-called freedom. Then for me to access this freedom, what I need to do is to channel my energy into the better way of finding my own personal freedom. So through art, I realized that, hey, you know what, there's something that is good with it, um, if you are good at it, you know? So, yeah, through that, when I was outside, I, I think I, I joined the Artist Proof Studio, a scholarship that I did not finish because uh, I had problems, my personal problems at that time. Then, I did, I did only one, one year, year, and then after, after one year, year then I, I had a problem. I could not come to school for a week or two. Or two then I was expelled, saying, you you not even following uh, what we teach you, all this and that. Because I was like, but you're teaching me something that I know already. Can you teach me differently? Yeah. You know, so from that time, then that's when, you know, I I entered for the Reynolds Casero Award which was when I won it, then that's where I was like, oh, this is it now, you know, because I, I managed to get a, my, my work to get attention for me. Even though that time I had, I, I used to do realistic work, but um, one of the colors that used to take my work on consignment, um, they, like a board of work that was worth around 300,000 disappeared, you know. Yeah, I mean, the expensive work, I'm talking the expensive work that time was like 1.5. Yeah. So think about, you know, so uh, 2000, um, that was before my hour. 2009, I did not paint for all year. I was crying, I was worried, you know, because that's when they told me about my work. Then, yeah, I've fallen in love with collage. I think when I posted one piece of paper in a, a blank canvas, then I started to fall with the gripping, you know. Then through visualizing or uh, projecting my life, I realized that this is maybe perhaps the nature wanted me to convert or change or to find my trueness in me, which is what I'm doing today. So, yeah, I think through that, there's so much <laughs> to this. So, yeah, through that, that's when I, I thought maybe uh, the, the art is injected in my blood, so I have to share it with the world, you know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah um, I mean, I, I, mean I, I did that also just to demonstrate how, you know, each of you have had these, these different paths and how you um, came into art because I think often um, the disillusion with, with art is that, you know, we all have, we, we can follow a formula um, and it's not necessarily so. Um, and so I think from here, it would be great to just, I mean, I've, I've kind of listed a, a, a number of questions that will help um, structure um, the conversation, but really, I think it's important for us to have a conversation so that we get as much um, you know, from, from this as, as we can, but also just to engage with, with the audience um, as well. Um, so 
my next um, provocation is about, you know, so fine, you, you decide you want to become an artist. And there's this thing called finding a vocation, so a, a language that you then grasp onto. Um, and that makes you uniquely you, so that, you know, when you look at an artwork, you say, that's definitely Nicholas, that's M Mandipa, that's Lady Scotty, that's Blessing. Um, can you talk a little bit about finding that vocation? Um, and I, you know, uh, uh, the, the great uh, talk show host Oprah talks about <laughs> the aha moment. <laughs> so when you had that aha moment and, and, and you thought, okay, this is my language um, and I'm gonna use it to talk, uh, to talk about issues in, in this year. Yeah. language. Yeah, There's a set, set of ideas that, that one, I think, plays with and thinks about all the time, but a painting versus a print versus a sculpture versus a performance answers totally different questions for me. So I think that um, just personally, the day that I become stuck in one mode of working, whether it be a material or a particular sort of set, set of, of symbols, symbols that people can look at and know that, that it's, oh my God, that's my nipa. Then I failed, actually, yeah. and I'm bored with myself. Yeah. And, and the challenge for me has just been that because I got very quickly into a very commercial space of working, um, there was that pressure to have a particular signature or a, oh, that's a man deeper. Um, and in a way, that's amazing because it helps you build a customer base, which is what is important in many ways. But then at some point, it becomes like this really restrictive thing where now you're wanting to repeat the Mandipas all the time, which A, for me, is boring. And B, I think for a customer or a person who's interested, not even necessarily a customer, whether it be a student or a museum director or whatever, it just becomes boring, I think. <laughs> so. The, the space of being able to explore whether it's a failed or a, a wonderful experiment is you know, a question in itself. But I think that space of being able to just be and work with what you think or what you imagine you want to work with on that day is what excites me about being an artist. So it's sad and it's horrible to not always be able to sell, but at the same time being able to be digging those kind of, um, or digging up the ideas or continuing to ask the questions even if you don't have a clear answer is what is important for me. Can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> for me, um, my, my like visual identity comes very much from not only music, mm -hmm. because my mother was obsessive with giving us opportunities to do stuff that she loved and that she didn't get to do. And so my sister did art and music and then I did music and art, but I was always very good in art and music, and my sister was only good at music. And what's interesting for me in music, you get the concept of the leitmotif, which is like the theme. Um, and so for me, I've always wanted to have something in my art that's very obvious, and that's very obviously me, because my biggest hero in my life and one of my biggest inspirations is Andrew Lloyd Webber. You know who that is? I'm going to use all my money and my power to, to meet him <laughs> <laughs> eventually. <laughs> but he's also a very big collector of pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood art. And so what's interesting for me is that when, like a visual language is a weird thing because as artists, I think we, we always see signs. And so even like um, when I was growing up, my father used to take us to different caves to see different cave drawings and, and that. And in my mind, I felt like that meant I had to be a printer of some sort because I thought that art was about mimetically painting and making painting look like it's real life. Like I didn't know that you could have a visual language that's not something that looks like real life. And then when I started doing printing, I figured out that I hate process, precision, and maths, and chemicals, and neatness, <laughs> and clean clothes, and, oh, and, and dirty clothes, and stuff. So when I went to Michaelis, I think that helped me understand the aha moment of, I want to be an artist, but I don't want to be an artist.
just like how these people are being artists because I would go to university and wear beautiful clothes all the time because I'm colored and you always have to be fresh and then they would make fun of us at Michaela's and be like, ah, oh, look at these plastics and their out little outfitries and I used to cringe like this, like, like, I'm so sorry, Mandy, but I never come to any of your classes because I hate clay. So I would just be like, why must I get dirty? So I would be like making sculptures like that. And then I was like, um, I, I want to be an artist, but I don't want to be someone who has to have paint splatters on my clothes and like be dirty and all of these things. And I think for me, the aha moment was that my mom would sign us up for all of these things. I can write music, I can read music, I can compose, I can play three instruments. And I understood that you can be the best at something and not make a difference. And that's what's funny with me with the music, because I hate being poor as well, and musicians are just, <laughs> it's just poverty. Oh my God, it's so much poverty. And so I was just like, I'm not gonna do this, and I wanna do music and I wanna do all these things. So if you go through my Michaela stuff, it's this ridiculous thing of like musicals and art and, and, and like, like people at Michaela's telling me that I'll never make it because I like drawing genitals and I, I don't know how to draw hands. And it was so weird. And so for me, it was like, okay, fine, then I'll do it from the outside. So my, my aha moment was thinking that I was not good enough. And so I went to work in a gallery for three years or two years. Sorry, I never do things for more than two years, even relationships. So I went to a gallery, worked there for two years and figured it out. Like, I figured everything out. I was like, oh, look at these people, and look how they talk about their art. And, like, if you ask them about their art, they don't even know how to answer you. And for me, I love drama, and I love acting, and music, and performing. And so even if my art was lower, which it was at the beginning, I was able to talk it up in such a way that people were like, I know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. And so I think my aha moment was really working in galleries and hanging up people's art that I did not think was worthy. That's my aha moment. <laughs> I'll run back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to me, I feel it, we all speak, whether you're a musician, an architect, a, a poet, whatever you are in the creative uh, spaces, it's one language. But if we're to use language as an analogy, to me, I feel each one has a different dialect when they speak. With me, that dialect was when I got to. I mean, I, I, I really love, and I'm grateful that I had the Makas who, who groomed me to help me find myself and put me from Deep Water Farm. What they always ins insisted on was the importance that we should never, ever follow the trends. Yeah. We had to till our own grounds. And what they would say to her, that was Bonita, and she'd always say, if there is a movement, it's given a name. And you can identify it. Yeah. You know that it's buried. It's long gone. It's an unveiling of something. So she, and along with her colleagues, they encourage us to never go to unveiling gatherings. We had to basically celebrate that. We had to be the, the ones who sow the seed of the new ideas. And to me, I think my, my dialect is, is how I, is the materials and the processes I employ in creating my own images. And even though, like Nanda was saying, you don't want to be part of that, but it's very hard, even if you do not, the world still decides, okay, this is Nandi and you know Nandi. So I have something similar to that. When I drifted away from using color and ribbons in my paintings and drawings, wanting to go white, just do the gray so that people can be allowed to imagine. I still have many calls, you know, can you please give us color? <laughs> and, and now it makes me feel like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dressmaker, not even a fashion designer. Someone comes here, I want it to look like this, then you make it that way. So, so to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel it, it is a dialect, and my dialect is how I process my materials the way I intervene with them and the, the obscure images I create because I, I dwell in madness. It's a place I feel happy at. Yeah, I think for me, um, 
I would, I would, I would think maybe having your own style, like your own natural technique, helps you to to find your own voice. Because um, with me, for instance, when when I founded my my style, you know, I fell in love with the sound of a teaser when I'm cutting the the material, the paper, uh, when I'm paging, you know, looking for a specific image to fill up my non-existing figures, which is driven from, um, you know, when you put a face of a person, you know, people, they come and now start to claim, hey, why did you, you know? So for me, through that, I realized that art, uh, by um, putting layers and destroying what existed to create something new, it also helps me to have that voice that is my own language. And yeah, I think through that process, through that thinking, mm -hmm. therefore, that's, that, that, is a, that is a moment of being me, uh, uh, where also, also being, being compared, compared to uh, uh, other, other masters, masters like Picasso, Jean Michel, you know, you know all these people that I've been compared to, to which, which is, is if there are 10 of them, them therefore, therefore I'm different. I'm different. Yeah. I have my own language, so I think that's how you uh, also to think. You know, as 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 a person, as a, a black child, I need to be able to think beyond uh, what existed already and find um, something to create it uh, to look different. You know, so, so, so through, through that, that process, at some point, point that's, that's what also, also created this, this session that we are in today to be different. You know, not to be like a history where you have to die and then, then you found something on your name without your presence, you know? So you have to be there to authorize it, you know? So that's my thinking, actually. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've, I've heard each of you kind of uh, speak um, um, about the people that uh, played a, a role in some sense in, in, in your thinking and how you... Um, you know, have navigated uh, finding yourself, so so to speak, and and again, I think this relates to why we're also sitting here because I think what Blessing is doing through this this prize speaks to the question of mentorship, um, which is often um, I think it's an I feel like it's been it's 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 neglected in the in the art space. It it, it kind of the, the onus is on somebody and somebody's willingness to to want to do it. And, and actually, you know, um, see a, a young artist grow. And, and I thought maybe you could each speak about the influence of, of mentorship in, in building, building your, like who are those, those mentors that really had a, you mentioned um, Gail Alexandra, you mentioned Marcus, you know, you mentioned your parents and, you know, um, how mentorship plays a role in growing an artist. Yeah. And how to, how to build relationships, because I think sometimes uh, young artists don't know how to, I mean, uh, I've had a few y young artists come to me and say, can you be my mentor? And I'm like, I don't know what, what to teach you. <laughs> like, what can you do? Yeah. Like mentoring. So how do you kind of, yeah, yeah. can you speak about in both ways, ways being the mentee and, and the mentor? Yeah. Well, that's a nice way. How to build rapport? So I had maybe two, one, fifteen. <laughs> or perhaps I want to be listening to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I had a project, project with Ali Shapu, who was supposed to be my mentor, and that was supposed to be his protege. Um, we both agreed that nobody else was part of that project that never worked. Or the team of that <laughs> never worked. Uh, because he also didn't understand uh, what am I supposed to do. And when I when we had our chat once, he said, no, just be like a, pa a father, like a grandfather to me. Uh, because I worship all people, because that's where I feel you find good wisdom. I was brought up by an old girl, and I am that old girl. She was like a matron in a, in a boarding school. She was, she was a commander in a military base. She was hell. We hated her. <laughs> we all did until she's gone. And she always said, no, you remember me when I'm dead. I'm like, bitch, and we do. <laughs> and all that she said was, she was right. She taught us um, 
about the difficulty of life. And to me, that's my mentor. Uh, the other people I've, I've come across in the world, not really. They all have their chips on their shoulders, and I have mine. Uh, for, uh, for an artist, I think the best mentor, apart from the artist, but it depends from person to person. Some people love being babies, and I don't like being a child. That's the problem we have in America. I could not be sitting and watching him, because there's guys who are going to say, no, just get out of here. No, you find me doing my thing, I can't just be waiting for another man doing his thing and watch him. Another man then go to wait. Um, for me, I had Murata Mudaung coming to me, asking the same thing. I was introducing him uh, with a blessing, because they made clothes, they had a new art quality, they were making clothes, they were doing everything. So he asked me, he even got his cousin to, to really uh, persuade me to agree to, to becoming his mentor. So what do I do then? Do I raise him as a child? Do I show him around and tell him how hard or how nice the world is? <laughs> and then we thought, I got to realize that we're hoping for the easier things in life. Whereas with me, it was more like if you are a farmer, and you've got, got a bit of a rocky surface. Your, your, your the land you bought is not good enough for cultivating any any crop. Any crop. So, so you have to try and make it to be good. So you had to, like, you have to go through that rocky surface and hope that eventually you might do some good topsoil to grow crops on. And that's how I was brought up. That one, you need to be closer to yourself. Love yourself first, so that you can love the others. Believe in yourself, your own best friend, and understand that you are born into us as my grandmother. You're born into us, we're just here to make sure you grow up. We may die, we might die before you, or you may die before us, but we want to for as long as we live. If you don't die until you grow up, so to be sure that you'll be able to fend for yourself. But know this child, the world out there is hell. If you depend on friends, you are in trouble. Depend on you, love yourself, be truthful, that's what, what was most important. Be truthful, it does not mean you'll be saved from any trouble. You might sink deeper into the darkest of wells with lives yet to devour you. So that's what I was brought up. So that's what I share with young artists as well. Perhaps have your whole city become your mentor. At times, not look at us as artists or other artists because we might just get lost. We might start copying them. So I was sharing my assistants when I used to have them. Look into the outside world. When you wake up, look outside. Look at people. Those become your mentors. And remember what you're taught at home. If I'm not taught the same thing, you will do what drives me is what I was taught at home. That's my mentor. My grandmother is my mentor. Anish Kapoor, that's how it cannot work because he's not... He didn't grow up in there. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth. It did not. <laughs> 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 Nothing that is initiated has to work. Because yeah. I think we're brought into a world where we all have to be good to have to succeed. We do not have to pass or pass to success or to a person has to fail in order to be able to be to get somewhere. So what I would share with people, like mentoring, people need to learn to look, listen, they need to observe, they need to learn to feel first before they look with their eyes. They need to start by feeling and allow this, this little kid to play this game of analyzing. To me, the mentor should be oneself before you look into the outside. People need to take heed of what's happening around them and learn through that. And then maybe they'll look at Nandi Power or maybe scroll your blessing and see if they could learn something from them. But if they come to me, I won't lie to them because I'll give them what works for me. What works for me won't work for all them. So people need to learn to be, to be self-pitying and self-reliant. I don't know how to put it. You know, you could just, in as much as I hear everything that you're saying, I think what's been interesting for me is that I have, at different stages of my life, have decided that it would be wonderful to teach at university and figure out, like, Okay, when I was inspired by whatever it was that was happening that made me want to become an artist, how do I then impart that kind of information to somebody else, right? And it's a difficult thing to figure out when people come from so many different backgrounds. People have very different like home situations where they understand their own worth and how that then functions within whatever they choose to do. Um, and then you have this very complicated thing where 
the teachers of our education system has taken a lot of people who are younger than you and me. Oh. So oh, when I'm, I'm sorry, the education system, that's a prisoner. That's the first. <laughs> you can say that because we're. I see this in prisoner. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not disagreeing. But I think that the interesting thing for me right yeah. now is being able to work at Zip, for instance, and I don't do it like all the time. I'm like, six months, please <laughs> let me run away. But to understand that our education system is failing people who are younger than you and me, and the fact that when they come to university or even if it's not even say university, when they come to the space of mentorship, even if it's somebody who sends you an email and says, Oh, please can you be my mentor? I don't think people really understand what it means. They do not. No. So <laughs> now you're stuck. So now you're stuck or not really stuck, but you put yourself in a situation mm -hmm. where you're trying to encourage people to um, think outside of the box and think clearly around what they experience on an everyday basis and what it means to now be coming from your home to zip. What are you experiencing? Who do you see? What's going on? And they expect to be spoon-fed things that you cannot... Spoon-fed champagne and events. Explain to them because you don't have the same perspective. You don't have the same... So it's a very complicated situation that uh, we're finding ourselves in where... On one hand, <laughs> I totally agree with you, but then on the other, there's this space of feeling like you're letting people down who need a different kind of guidance, and you don't know how to bridge the gap. I wish we were starting on us looking into politics, because most kids... Most than you. <laughs> no, no, I was saying, you know what, what most kids, you know what, most people... They, <laughs> most kids, especially the artists, what they do... To call, call out the Amish, for example, they now go to, go to the open up. Yeah. They like 95 people on Friday, they want to do this. And then they look good. And so, to me, <laughs> to me, yeah. I believe school does not give you the freedom to be educated. That's why I say that's the first. Education is in school. Even where you live, whether it be your parents, whether it be your next door neighbors, whether it be, that's what I mean by education. Education of the world. Because what I was going to say, sorry for that, yeah. is that with the people who seek perhaps guidance from another person, you have to assume the role of a parent. That's number one. Number two, you have to assume the role of a teacher, and you have to be their therapist. They'll want you to give, want you to give them everything. And then, because when they want, some, not all of them, there's a greater number of them when they want you to mentor them, said or not said. Uh, at times, you get a sense of hoping to be like you. You have to give them the recipe, that your recipe is the only one. They forget that bread, each house bakes the same bread. It's the same process, technically, differently. But they want you to give them the same recipe for, you know, the old language that you need in your bread and you leave it for rice and you, you bake it tomorrow, you steam it, however you choose to. But they forget that if you're baking bread, even if they say it's one teaspoon of sugar, a pinch of salt, you know, a little bit of milk, whatever you're putting in your bread, your teaspoon and my teaspoon is not the same. So <laughs> I'm so bored of everybody yeah. asking me to be yeah. their mentor. Yeah. I'm done with that. Mm. Okay, because sorry. Because people want you to tell them, like you said, with a recipe, and our recipe will not never work out the same way. Yeah. Different stage, it is different like experiences of life and different like home situations and everything. Everything is always different for everyone, and that is why I never get a mentor in the art world. And that's why it's easy. That's why my life has worked out this way, because my mentors are architects like Ezra is. Um, it's Theodore Kim, who knew me for a long ago from a very weird man. He got me the Thai brand gig, and I was like, hey, that changed my life. And he's not an artist, he just loves art. And so I would never ever go to another artist and ask them, can you please teach me how to be an artist? Because I just don't think it works out for everybody the same way. My mentors have been actors, architects, 
and to build up to our agency, because it's my dream to be the first artist to be represented by an agency, like an advertising agency. And I just think that it's very confusing when you're trying to tell someone else how to do art the way you do art for them to then be an artist. I have a studio assistant that I've had for four years, and she's lovely, and we have a very similar way of thinking. Like now we both have bald heads, we both wear genitals, and we both do fruits. I mean, it's not cohesive or sustainable. <laughs> it's not going to work out, because guess what? If we should meet each other on the future in a panel like this, like I'm going to be sitting now, I'll be like, ba 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 Yeah, I think for me, um, I would, I would uh, line up with what Nicola said about invite yourself to the table, because you know the system will never invite you if you don't come. So for me, um, being at the Bag Factory helped me to just force myself into uh, Zen Promoter Studios, Dr. David Golani Studios, and other artists that are we were at the back at that time. And for me, the whole, for me to be there, talking to them, talk to, talking to them, for instance, it did not say I'm learning or I'm you know, from them, but it pushed my own personal thinking about my creative process, you know, to allow myself to be in that space and talk to somebody. Hence, whenever I, I have people in my studio, students or whoever that works with me, I always say, hey, I'm giving you the space to think. You know, you have a space, you have material, you have like things to work around with. Therefore, I won't, I won't hold your hands to say, draw this line, draw that. It has to come from you. You know, that's, that's the original, uh, originality of being creative, you know, in the space because you have to bring something that is that within, you. within you. For me, I won't, I won't get into your heart and say, you like drawing bags, you like drawing what, you know? So for you, you have to find things, you know, and there's so many things. Hence, I always say I obtained my degree in the street of Joburg, you know, because I've been observing, I've been talking to strangers, I've been like, I mean, admiring things, you know. At some point, I would like, hey, if I can be a cat and climb in that glass wall, you know, just for a moment, <laughs> how it's going to feel to be that person. So, you know, so those are the things that, that allows, I think, the creative thing to come, you know, yeah. to come out, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Um, just for, you know, the interest, you know, the interest of time, and also just to give, to be able to give um, the audience an opportunity to, to ask questions as well. I'm just going to speed up a bit, but I'm glad we, we, we had a kind of heated debate around this question because, because, it, because it leads to, again, again as, you as you were mentioning, mentioning education. Um, and the, and the, the, the question around the self-taught artist and a formally trained artist has also been a very contested kind of um, conversation, I think, particularly in, in the South African context where, you know, um, as, as uh, uh, Oluetu kind of was mentioning in my, you know, what I did my PhD on, which was on so-called rural, rural artists, which who, who most, most of them never, never got um, formal training, in fact, you know. So, so from uh, uh, Dr. Jackson Shongwani to Mam Noria Mabasha, for example. Um, those, those kinds of artists, artists and, and that's exactly what I was tapping into um, when, you know, when I did that, that was to really hone in and question this idea of um, the role of education um, and art schools, particularly in, in South Africa, and how they shaped you know, the discourse around who becomes an artist, who becomes, you know, the next, you know, big, big, big star. And what are your thoughts around this, this question of this, the self-taught artist versus being formally um, trained? I envy the outside artists. Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> I envy them because they're not in prison like we are. Yeah. They're not. Mm. To me, if we were to look compared to uh, artists to children, like babies who they're still under 
a year or seven because when they are born, when they see the first pair, they begin to say no without saying no, they just take you off. And then your life, throughout your life, what's happening all the time, say no, no, no. Do it this way, do it that way. No, 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 no. And also the artist to me, I like the baby. They free, have you seen a child? A child when they're still very young, before they can like take heed of her saying no, you'd be a table. They'll hold this thing, and the whole, they'll hold, have about four or five things they're playing with. And they'll be on that one and try and take this one away, and they see you. They will scream and come back to that thing, and then they let them take it and they go back to that one. You go and touch it again, and they will scream. And when we're born, we just always like, no, close up, close up, don't open your eyes, just shut up, shut up. That's what we're taught to do, to be like, he starts at home, and he goes into school, and then we see the world, you know, like a, a horse on a race course, with blinkers, don't look at the audience, be like this. Whereas outside the artists, we're like, they don't know some of the rules we, 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 we abide by. They're just walking like this, like wild horses in the field. Whereas we trained ones, I think that's where it is. Even if you're a trained artist, you're trying to make an outside artist of the kids that you're inspiring or encountering or whatever, then you're fucked. Like, you, you are basically working backwards because... You as a trained artist? Oh, sorry. Can, can, the thing is, can, can I, can I, can I that's an important outsider. thing. Because I, I dropped out in second year. So can I also be, can I be an outsider artist then? Do you know what I mean? Like no, I not quite, but you can. But you can be. Uh, it's the way he did. But the point is, Laura, I'm encountering children that are like you, who dropped out in second year, who, some of them are necessarily trained in art, uh, during high school, um, and then they're like, oh, okay, art might be a good thing, or they're told by other people that because you don't have a maths brain, then you should become an artist. For instance, before you came here, yeah. what did I tell you? Yeah, you were What did I tell you? You need I said, I math. wish I could do maths. Yes. <laughs> because then I would never have done art. Yeah. And then I heard that you said you were good at maths. I would disagree. <laughs> I wish I could know. No, you can. You can, ladies, scholarly. Mathematics. Forget, forget about the one that teach you at school. I have forgotten because I left it in grade eight. No, forget about it. It is not the only mathematics. The whole world. The, our existence is maths. It's numbers. What I'm trying to just explain is that when, at least for me, in terms of teaching or helping somebody through the space of trying to be an artist or trying to think outside of the box. Why I mentioned our education system in the first place is that there's this expectation that I will come with some kind of a formula that says, if you put pepper and salt and whatever together, then you can be like a killer painter. Whereas now I'm coming to you as a young artist or a young aspiring artist, and I say, do you, B? Do what you would like to do, express what you would like, tell me what you experience on an everyday basis, use that as the inspiration for what it is you want to portray, how you want to even think about your art making process. And then these kids can't even do that because from where they come from, there's this space that they need to have a formula. But I think Nandi, the reason they cannot, it's, Maybe it's not a subject for here, but we can tap into it. It's, it goes deeper than just the art school. That's my view. I mean, look at people in general. We're born into a world that wants us to march a particular way. You have to have a particular walk. We have to see a world with, with, with a certain pair of eyes. If you begin to look this way, there's something wrong with you. You have to be somehow retrained, or if you're an android, you need recycling, or maybe be you belong to the dumpster. So it, it runs beyond us in the arts. That's why I use the analogy of a child. You have one, which is nice. When a child is born, they're free, and we, we try and chain them. And education is part of the chaining of the mind. Mathematics, 
it's not, not only the formulas they teach us, it's not only those. It is everywhere, all the time, thinking about it or not even thinking about it. Even the dumbest of soul, they can calculate. The reason we fail maths is because we have to calculate in a particular way. I failed my math. I've got an age for it. It's just deplorable. But I'm very proud. <laughs> but when I unpacked why I failed my mathematics to get to you, it was not because I was not good at mathematics, because of how I was taught mathematics. Because I had to, I was made to be like, this is how you do it. There's no other way. You can have something, if you come with the answer, it's good. But how did you get there? Because we're in a world that believes we need to prove everything we do. So that's where it lies. That's where everyone is stuck. It's not even the education. Even our education, we talk about it. Everyone else in it. For example, you mentioned that, which is a wonderful one. Sorry, sorry, uh, Prof. <laughs> we are in 2020, it's post-apartheid, 94 came. All reform was done in the country, but not education. And they did it, why? To imprison us even more. They dropped the standards that people need to achieve in order to pass their subjects to what now? Is it 25 or 30 percent? Um, I'm a child so of the what, <laughs> what, what, what is happening? Because I think it's a bigger picture. Because I think the more materials we have for your carpet, the, the better so that it's fluffy when it's winter. Mm. That is what is happening. Shut down the brains. Mm. If it was not advocate that no one should go to school, they should learn from home, get the parents teaching their own kids, because it's another subject. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, um, firstly, I was expelled from artistic studio mm -hmm. because I could not understand what they were teaching because what they were teaching I already knew. For me, um, whatever that they were doing, it was my, from the time when I was training myself to, to do a portrait, for instance, or to draw a straight line, so I knew about it. So when I started to like, hey guys, I, I can't, I can't take what you do. Can you teach us differently? That's when they were like, no, you're talking too much, leave us. Then for me, it was a, a passage. It was like I asked for a passage to uh, reach somewhere where my art it is today. For instance, um, with the educational system that we have uh, in a broader context, there is a education that teaches people to go to make other people richer. Whereas, in my thinking, I would suggest that if the education system can be able to teach you how to think for yourself and think for the people that are in your same mindset, you know, because remember that I, I argued about being a surrealist painter, meaning when I started the style that I'm doing, I never knew about surrealism. I never get any formal, you know, educational background to tell me where do I fall from. So then I'm like, no, I think I'm not an, a surrealist painter because it's a historical kind of way I Andre Breton. When I made a follow-up, right, to know what is this all about, Andre Breton and them, they created those things when they were resisting telling the story, you know, during that time. So, so therefore, therefore, for me, I, I, I call, call myself Josieism, uh, whatever, whatever. But, but I call, I call myself, myself because I founded these things, things in the scene, you know. So, so therefore, therefore, not having that background also allows me to do what I like, create what I like, and say things that I like because I'm not limited to think, oh, I have to save the other than to save me. And uh, for me, the black child, each time when you come with your own invention, the system classifies you under European, uh, you know, uh, trends. Why can't we have our trends that belongs to, uh, to the black child? So that's the question that I always try to answer, but, you know, I cannot answer it because the books, they've <laughs> blackmailed our black history, our excellent, our strongness, you know? <laughs> So, so yeah, I, 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 that's, that's my, my thinking, that's, that's my suggestion. So and I want to come back to what you talked about, loyalism, yeah? Um, because when I was in school, um, all the children's parents were wardens at Pulsmore, 
So every time we had a holiday, like a like a school kind of outing, they would take us to Polesmore and we'd pay one rand to go to Polesmore. And there's, I don't know if you guys know, but there's an entire wing in Polesmore, which is just men who are allowed to have dreads in their cells. So like their cells aren't locked. And um, it's like a like an area like this where there's like a big quad, like quad in the middle. And then everybody has like murals. So in my life, like muralism for me, not only was like art on, on cave drawings and stuff, but I would go to the jail like four times a, a year and see all these blurred murals that these men would do. And none of them went to art school. And so for me, I understood that you can have a style without going to art school because everybody that's in the books and everyone that they talk about are people that they call outsider artists who didn't go to school. And so for me, it was important to also not be broken down by art school, which is what I felt like art school always did to me when I was there in a very weird way, which I never understood. And so when I left there, I finished with a degree in Dutch literature <laughs> and art history. So no, I don't have a degree in art, but I left because I just felt like I can't spend another year defending why I want to draw the way I want to draw. And so it was interesting for me to understand the concept of an outsider artist and someone that's within the structure. Because at Michaelis, we pay the same amount as, as medical students, mm -hmm. but we don't have a way to understand how to monetize what we do. So we end up paying like 42 to 45,000 rand in 2008 and nine. Um, per year for something, and that's excluding every single material you have to buy to then also still do the art. Um, and I think that once you get into art, you think, oh my God, I've made it. And then you realize once you've made it, you still have to have another 15 to 20K a year for a camera that they're going to tell you three days before that you have to have. Um, and I just didn't understand how that could be what I wanted for my life. Like every time I have to compete with people who can who can afford a DSLR camera within three days. Mm -hmm. um, and my parents are teachers, and, and my dad, he had a high-up government job, but what is that when you have three people depending on you? Um, and so for me, I just I really made it a point to not finish in art. I just never wanted to be the, oh, and when they do that thing with foot, that they call foot, and then you stand, and then someone comes in and, and, and talks to you about your art, and then like half of you cry, and then that's supposed to what? Then accuse me? Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> I, I left Michaela's. Hi, Felicia. Laura, that was Michaela's. That's, Laura, that's, that was Michaela's. that's all yeah. of them. And, but the, the point for me really is yeah. the reason I try and go back and be in those places oh, is to try and figure out how, yeah. not even to correct it because I'm not part of the higher system of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But just to try and figure out, like, how do you then help these kids navigate their way around this particular problem? Mm. It's the same. Because Drop out of art school. Drop out of art school. <laughs> I believe, <laughs> too. I, I understand. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Because, you know, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We are. No. Okay, don't. Don't I'm drop out of art school. I'm, I'm in a different <laughs> space. Same school. But we all are born to be initiated on to, to march on a certain path. And what am I talking about? I don't, I don't know, know whether it fits here, but, but we are born. born I'm just asking myself what I'm We are all born to be walking on a certain line, and it has to be that line. Mm -hmm. Look at the whole world. Look at artists from everywhere in the world and everything else. You can live us. Just let's look at, at ourselves as human beings before artists. We're born to walk on a particular line. And we're in a wonderful time where we could overhaul all of, all of that. We in South Africa, most of us were, were forced to go to church, right? That's education. And you go to school because you have to see the world. You have to have this vision. These are the goggles you wear all the time. And the school is the same thing. It's a hard one. And how do I unravel that and just do something new? Um, that's why I'm asking again what am I talking about, but <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. I live in a different world, but I feel this time what is so wonderful is when you get to see or get a sense of how this world operates. The world is like a funnel, put things into a funnel, but let's put it upside down. Let's put it the right way up, rather, and put grain there. 
we just really are directing everything to go totally towards that spout there. I think that's what it is. We're being nailed to think in a particular way, do things in a particular way, because what we do as artists is no different to what doctors do. I mean, doctors are not just doctors or controlled by someone else, it's the pharmaceuticals. They, grow, they gave them grants to go and study. It's the same case with us. We're just being channeled to think this way, and this is the only way we should see the world. And that's why I envy the outside artists in regards to, if I leave all the crap about us as a human race and what is happening with us, if I take that all out and look at the outside artists, I feel when I compare myself to them, I find them to be much, much better. Because they might not produce works that I look at and, and with, with high regard, but the reason I won't see, I won't regard them highly is because the way my mind and the eyes judge the images I make is trained by the way I should make my work. That's where it becomes interesting. It goes to the education itself. I mean, I love education, but education doesn't free us as much as you made to believe it does. It does not. We get imprisoned first by our parents and then the education and the entire system. Um, that's why I say, what am I talking about? Something else, but freedom. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's that thing. It's too complicated. I wish I could free myself from it, but I can't. But I'm grateful to have, to have the education and wish to have had none. Because... Also, on one hand, saying one is not educated is nonsense. Everyone is educated, but it's how you are educated that makes us feel like we're educated or not. Because yeah. we're part of this big grouping of how we got educated. Everyone is. I mean, if a child were to be born in the gutter somewhere there, and they live there, that child will be educated. They'll learn the ways of living that life. Um, with us, we're born, we're taken to the formal way of education, we're being nailed to think in a particular way. We see ourselves as being educated and they're not. That's why I say, what am I talking about? It's greater than that. I think that's, that's, that's fundamentally what all of, all of you are saying, is this question of how do, how do, we, yeah, how do we educate? Um, that, that, um, that's the question in, 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 our, in our education system. It's, it's how do we cater to, you know, the different, um, the, I mean, essentially that's what, you know, Fees was for, really, uh, you know, what resonated with, with the children that were saying. And then the question of, you know, decolonization and all of that. But we're really just um, kind of asking, how do we, you know, <laughs> how do we navigate the space of, of, of being in, in, in the way in which we're being educated is, is questionable. Yeah. Because so, I feel yeah. it cannot be changed. Sorry for interrupting. I'm always interrupting. It cannot be changed because once we've done that, if it's an atom, it's gone, it's gone. It, there's no stopping it. Mm -hmm. There's no way we can ever decolonize ourselves because that is already the process. It doesn't stop. It runs, it runs very fast. It does stop. It evolves and assumes various new characters. Anyone who believes they'll decolonize themselves, they're fooling with themselves. You can't. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah, that's, yeah, that's, we'll be delving into, into another area, area there, but let, let me just pull it back to, um, and, 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 and the, you know, the, 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 the last two questions, questions um, before, before I open up to, to the floor, floor um, is, again, it, it leads back to, you know, uh, uh, you know this, this path of um, accessibility, and, and this one I know will, will also be uh, a, a contested kind of um, discussion around gallery representation, because again, <laughs> that is how artists, you know, they <laughs> how, how artists become known, and you know. So, so the question for me that I'd I'd like you to to to, to answer quite you know briefly really is, does a does an artist need gallery representation, and if so, what is the role of the artist? I mean, I, I was a big person who was always like, <laughs> you never need it. The internet is a representation, <laughs> and I think that you can push that agenda only so far. Mm. Um, and that's what I did. I was very good at that. I was, I was someone who was, because I worked in a gallery, and I was always like, this is insane. Like, people are giving this much of what they make with their actual soul and their heart and their being. And then I realized that I don't want to talk to people about stuff. And I don't, 
country who want them in my space negotiating with me. And I don't want them to think that they can come to me and get things for cheaper. And so I was only ever represented for the first time in 2017. And I was never represented in South Africa. I was represented in the UK. Um, and that was really nice for me until this lady started telling me about my ego and how I was supposed to feel and what I, and you know, people in the UK are done, they want things that are sexy and they heard about apartheid. And I was like, okay, so now I have to make sexy work. And then I realized that sometimes you have to just have an iron fist and you have to be hard in how you want to be represented by who, why, and in what way. And, and so I had one representation ever, like two years ago for the first time. And then now I'm with Ever I Bleed and they're just very chilled and open and they sell and they're one year younger than the ANC. And Laura. Laura. <laughs> 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 no, no, I, I think that uh, for me, this is generational question. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the issue that I have, and not that I have an issue with what you're saying, is that uh, we have a very different way of negotiating things. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, living in the age of the internet and how things work and the possibility of one working through Instagram and being able to have more kind of accessibility, there are ways that artists can negotiate this in a very different way. Yeah. Whereas if you talk to Bernie Searle, if you talk to Nicholas Sobo, if you talk to, uh, I don't know, even Peter Hugo, at his age right now, there is a different way of us negotiating how this person works. Yeah. And so for me, when I was in art school, the only understanding of what it meant to be a successful artist was to be in a commercial space, which meant gallery representation at that time. So even though there were five different galleries coming at me at once, which is what was happening, there was a real kind of pressure to make the right decision at the time so that you don't end up totally screwed. There are so many black artists, especially, that you hear of who have like a two-year career and then they fall off the face of the planet because whoever they chose to work with either lost interest in them or couldn't find clients or whatever it is. That's what I mean. It's like or would decide otherwise that do not know. Yeah. yeah. So I think that for me as a person who used to be represented by somebody for 13 years and making the decision to leave them, now, it's in a relationship time of COVID and all of that is a very complex thing because what a gallery used to mean 20 years ago to an artist means a completely different thing than what it means now. And I'm not negating that at all. No, I'm, I'm just saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm you're just negating. saying that it's interesting because with the with the coming of social media, it was a very different verse about six years ago. We're saying the same thing. years ago. <laughs> no, no, we are. We are. Yeah. We are. And for me, there was really galleries who used to do this thing of courting me. So they would have the like, these engagements with me and, and do shows with me and say that they, they're they going to show me because I should just be so like grateful for the fact that they're showing me. But I'm not allowed to commercially sell through them. And so that happened to me with probably the four main galleries within the Southern African context. And I just saw that as someone not wanting to commit to a younger artist who wasn't, I was never someone who understood why the gallery had such a big role to play, when at the end of the day, they are the pick and pay of art. They are the Mr. Price of art. They are the Ackermans of art. They're just the people selling your work. And then to me, when I figured out that you could have all these people, um, I was gonna say again, never mind. You could have all these people but at the same time, you wouldn't be able to draw what someone who is traditionally actually represented by them is getting. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like they would do these things where they say, we're doing a project with Lady Scully, hang dildos from the roof, yes, Christmas. And then I just don't make money from it. And that's why it took me so long to actually get represented by someone, which was pretty much last year. The people before was in the UK, it was Financia, I knew. And then I came back home and I just couldn't believe that I'm a whole 31 years old and everybody here talks about my art, but they don't want to represent me because they see me as what they call a trendy choice. Um, and so I just think I had a different experience of it because I literally only got into the game like five years ago, technically. Um, yeah, and then I, I decided to go with who I'm with because they never try and gossip with me. <laughs> can, can, yeah. I, can I 
can I can I just add um, something that is touching the previous question? Sure. Which um, I think to 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 know your art first, and then you go back to teach yourself how to. It's it's more of like when you get the color, there's so much uh, exploitation that comes with if you don't have that knowledge. So therefore, for me, if I said I obtained my degree on the street, I was telling you about my personal follow-up, you know, to start to know the formalities way of dealing with the gallery. But at the very same time, if you have a gallery that I never approached the gallery, they've been approaching me, then I decide whether do I want to go with the gallery or I don't. Then if I I agree, then I, I put my feet first, like this is one, two, and three, we are partners. I'm an employer as well because I contribute to to your space by creating works that when you sell, you, you take certain percentages. So I'm, I'm a businessman with you, you know what I mean? So for me, it depends on how do you negotiate the deal with the gallery. It does not mean being with the gallery then, uh, and also having a, a, a person to protect your work, which is important because if the market floods with your work, tomorrow you'll find uh, your work used as a doormat in one tea house. Then you get, get worried that, that the people, people are no longer interested in your work, but they, s they it's you flooded. So, so for me, me, I think it is important to have a gallery at the beginning of your career, and, and then when you start building your own empire, then, then you can start decide whether you have your own museum. You have for some of us, we we're dreaming big. You know, we even bought big lands. We are not trying to push beyond what the system think of the black child. You know. So, so uh, in my thinking, I think, I think at the beginning, beginning of your career, you do need a gallery. And, and then not to say you're destroying, you completely destroying the relationship that you have when you decide to move out. No, no you can, can be independent and then in a contract base that, yo, you can take works or you buy works for me. You know what I mean? And then you can do whatever with that work. You know, as long as you respect it and dignified my creativity. Yeah, can you repeat it? Yeah, just listen to the, the last comment and then we'll open up okay. to the floor. Yeah. Uh, the answer is a yes and no. Yeah. Gallery, Gallery representation is like a hook on the street, an off-road road. You a girl, you elect to go out by yourself at your own will. You want to, you know, to present what God has given you and get some reward out of it. And I will come and say, hey, really? Okay, this is my car. You know? Have you seen the movie Mona Lisa, the beautiful? It's my turf. Okay. Now I pay by my rules. You don't eat lunch. You only eat ice cream. You give me all the money. That's what the gallery does. Yes, of course. Like a pimp in the street is a hooker. It saves you from other pimps who come and say, hey, it's my turf. Right? Do whatever you do. Only eat ice cream and give me the money. It is good. In many ways, you have to grow. With me, when I was young, a blessed, just like you, from learning from artists, with artists with video and others, hearing stories about their pains with working with galleries. Um, so, no, no need to learn. And I could say, hey, I'm not doing this thing about working with galleries, because it's scary. Because hearing guys say, hey, so-and-so this, so-and-so that, like, no, 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 I don't want to go there. But I found myself there, which is wonderful. You get to learn, you get to grow. Um, it is good for you as well as not that good. I mean, you can still, of course, the world is about exploitation. That's why we, we mine all these minerals. We exploit whatever is there. And you as an artist, you're also a resource. And your gallerist is also your resource. You exploit them and they exploit you. It works that way. That's why people fall in love to exploit one another's emotions hey, and build something. So <laughs> it is just, it's one foundation of life, just exploiting. Yes, yes that's, that's when you get, that's when if it's a love relationship, people say, okay, I'm leaving you now. I'm tired of this one. Or maybe you see person of you inspired a thing, like a donkey in the middle of the road. <laughs> so, so 
so, but exploitation is one of the keys we make this life be. It is nice and it is not nice. We enjoy it when it's good, we don't enjoy it when it's not good. But that's, that's what it is about, life, the fact, we exploit the oxygen for that matter to be. We breathe in and out. And that goes on like that. And there's no yes and no answer, but it's all of them. It depends on you at the time. An artist can survive with the gallery and can survive without the gallery. The artists who are doing wonderfully well, they're not popular. No one knows of them. They're greater than all the guys you see in art history books. They're doing it without representation. Because at the end of the day, you just... Um, you just take in what you have. Uh, it takes a, it takes a lot of flogging for you to understand to wake up when they cheat you and they lie to you and say, "Oh, okay." Then you learn, like a girl on the street, exactly the same thing. You learn. It's a flogging. That's when there's disappointment. That's like flogging. And even businesses, it happens. People fall into relationship and fall out. So it depends from person to person. Here's why right. it helps when you're young, you get to learn, uh, but then the couple with education, that's where you get in informal education, you get to learn how dirty the art world machine is. It's filthy like any other machine. On all sides, as you not just the representers, the represented and the representers is just a, a filthy madness that we all love. So we open up to the floor as we as we wrap up, wrap up or for questions to our panelists. <laughs> is this if there are any? I thought there was um, And if there aren't any, I, I would just like to I'll, I'll ask them to just you know wrap up with what is what's what's in store for the future. Oh, there's one question there. So I was going to say, I have a question for Blessing and Nandipa, because throughout uh, the, this, this discussion, what I picked up is that the education system is definitely an imprisonment, and both you guys being parents, um, like, <laughs> so both of you guys being being parents, I don't know if Nicholas is a parent or Lady Skull, if you're a parent, I, a parent, I just definitely Let's know. Step on. That blessing and then deeper. Uh, I am and, a parent as um, well. To some so knowing that the education system is a is, is a pris is, is a prisonment, then um, are you like willingly gonna let your children be constitutional constitutionalized by 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 the system, or would you opt out for homeschooling, or like what's your take on it? Knowing the knowledge that you have and being a parent and like what's the outcome you see for the From future the of side. your kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think yeah. for me, um, I, I had my my firstborn when I, I did have nothing, you know, and uh, stepping into the art industry as a, prof a professional, uh, starting to unlearn the past to know the present uh, allowed me to to know that the institution system is, is fucked up, you know. Therefore, I'm still learning how to teach my kids to know how to do things at the very young age. I I often take them to my farm to teach them how to run a business at young age, you know, to know how to create their own system. Remember that all that we are tapping in is a system that was created uh, mostly, mostly not serving the black child. So, so therefore, in my thinking, I'm creating, creating a system that's going to benefit, you know, this black child, which is my kids, you know. know therefore, therefore, I wouldn't say much about it because I'm still struggling to unfree myself from, you know, what the system did to me. So that unlearning process... Uh, to know the now, I think it, it, it does visualize the future of my kids at this present moment. But yeah, it's a challenge. Can I step in as a non parent? Mm -hmm. I'm not a parent, but I'm a 
seen in a parental role to my nephew. Um, as much as I feel education is a, in prison now, I feel what, what I've been sharing with my nephew, who is 11 now, is the importance of him deciding where he wants to be, opening his eyes, not just his, going to himself and understand the complexities of the world. I mean, you need that caterer in order to understand that you are held captive. How will you know that you're a prisoner if you do not know that you're in prison? That's, that's where it is. So the children need that education, but they need to be allowed to understand that it is not the only one. They should exploit that education to free themselves from it. Because we all exist in the world, even us as South Africans, I'll just come to you. We were the first colonizers in this part of Africa. If we didn't have the Indian Ocean down that, that way and the Atlantic, we would have gone further down. We were just stopped by the water. We reached a no-go area. We couldn't go beyond. We also came, wherever we came from, from up north, with all the education and the wisdom from there, which has been slowly fading away, and we didn't have that much time to remember it all. The Europeans came in, and they're the ones to blame for all of this, aren't they? <laughs> but then one thing, if you're talking about colonizing and the new system, uh, there's one thing we never saw in Britain. We always go to something and we don't want to talk about. You see us, black and white, people of European descent and us of African descent, the, the people came in and intruded on this land. Just as we education, not think about something, the real South Africans, we, they are just on the side. We're not saying anything about them, which is a poison. And the people we found here, and we all bullied them because our people have some offensive things they say about them. If you were waiting for them for some weed, kind of a transaction, and they're late, what do you say to them? We was introduced to them as a child, and you see them popping up off, off the wood. What do you say to them? They say, no, they'll ask you, the protector said, they'll ask you, oh, sorry for waiting. Didn't you see me coming? They say, no, I didn't see you, just came out of the bush. They say, you never say that to a bushman because they're going to beat the hell out of you for they'll be offended because they say the truth not. So there, that's an offense. It is within the culture. We were the first bullies. We were the first colonizers. We came, almost have forgotten what we were taught wherever we came, where, whatever the center was, because we're not exactly sure. So with me, yes, take them to the education, but let them know that there's more to it than just that. It's not the only way. So they can be able to free themselves. If they wish, it's a personal decision. That's me. I'm not a parent. You know, I think that it's quite an interesting question that you're posing because if you're dealing with a child who is six or seven versus one who's two or three versus 11, there are lots of different ways that you need to navigate this situation. I think for me, um, that's probably part of the reason I've been interested in understanding how at 18 or 20, kids are thinking these days, you know, not how I was only four. Um, and so the space of trying to figure out how to educate her, the, the pressure that I put on her, um, what it means to be educated and, and what it means to be um, paying attention, learning, uh, understanding what I'm trying to impart, how she deals with other people, how she deals with her own situation, it's really complex, you know. I used to think that, um, I mean, granted my child might be a little bit intense, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I, I went on this like noble cause to try and teach her that like we all live in different circumstances. So I live in Kensington, so I force, not even force myself, like I have people who don't live in the same situation as me that I know. So I thought, oh, I'm being a good mom by exposing her to the fact that like there are some people who live in a shack, there are some people who live in an apartment, there are some people. But how she processed the information is how she processed it. So she says these horrible things like, oh, my house is so much nicer and neater than yours. 
to somebody that I would never say that to, for instance, you know? Well, that's and a human being. <laughs> but, but I think my point is, as a person who's trying to figure out, like, what it is you do and how to make, like, a most balanced human being, I don't know that there's a real answer to what that even means. Because she's only four years old, and she said that to somebody. And she's never heard it coming from me, you know? Embarrass so, us, I think. I think that um, the, the space of negotiating what it means to be a parent, how to deal with it, is different for each person. Like, there's no real, like, uh, route or specific way of dealing with it, you know? Julia also, sorry, Julia also feel inspired being taken to school. By the time you were ready to go to school, you already know what you are going to be anyway. The school is just nail polishing. You already what you are meant to be. Once you hit seven, you're already a human being just waiting for your ID. That's all. Training, going to school is just, you know, it's just this and that. That's why school teachers run into trouble with kids, because they already are old men and women, but still young. By the time, it's not the education that makes you. It's what, what we're going to be, and also what happened when we're born until we're seven or before seven and go to school. Because by the time we go to school, already I fully flesh human being just, you know, finalizing things. Education is just, you know, nibbling this and that, but you're not learning much. The character is already there. Whatever they may do, that's why some kids don't even make it to grade seven, is because they're not, not meant, meant to be marching on that path. And, and uh, yeah. yeah. I was raised by a colored mom who was also a teacher. And so I just feel like my upbringing was quite like abrupt in many ways. Um, and so it's very much like, you make one noise, I swear to God, I'm getting the lip and the big as a fucking dog in that noise. Swear to God. And then you kind of just like do your own thing. And that's where I first had my own space because I was alone and my mother would sleep and she's like, I've been dealing with children the whole day. So I swear to God, speak to me one more time and it's over. And so I just feel very strong in having the thought that my children will be feral and they will not go to school and you can take them to court because you can't. And they're gonna bite through wires and climb walls and bite people for mommy and not go to any nice school, because my mom used to send us to nice schools, because before apartheid, we couldn't go there. And now I'm like, I wish I didn't go to nice schools. So yeah, that's me. Also, I'm a stepmom. Hi. So mine is not really a question, but a comment on everything that we've been listening on and just to summarize it as obviously spectators. Okay, first of all, I think there's no formula for school or non-school. Because just as you said, by the time that you interact with school, you've already had a foundation. So I would say creativity is brought from home. If you're allowed to think outside the box, even if you are put within a box, you'd be able to go outside the box. I think the mix of whether you were in an art school, I mean, I'm in an SGB at, uh, the at NSA, and um, the parents that take their kids to NSA want their kids to have a bit of structure, given their circumstances, whether they can afford it, not afford it, but they want their kids to also think outside the box. So I think it starts at home to basically emphasize the creativity. If you can see that your child is waving towards a certain way. It's your thinking and, and you building that child. Whether they, there's gonna be a school anyways, whether it's gonna be formal school, whether it's gonna be in the streets, there's gonna be a school. I think it's, it's about how you, you empower your kids not to think of poverty, whether it be poverty of confidence, poverty of finances, they need to know that they are enriched because poverty is a choice, guys, whether it's poverty of whatever uh, asset, right? And I think we were talking about mentoring. Sorry, I'm just gonna go into certain things that we're talking about. Talking about mentoring, this session is mentoring. So mentoring is inspiration for me. It's not a classroom. It's not particularly calling somebody a mentor, you know? 
Um, there's a lot of people that will take ownership of giving themselves a, a, a crown to say I've mentored that one and that one and that one and that one. But it's just giving somebody an opportunity to be inspired, you know, not particularly giving them a formula. And I think the platform is about um, how, you know, success, how to be successful, you know, and success is defined differently by different people. So I think the mix that we have there as a panel, I mean, I've engaged with Dr. Kim, I don't think she remembers when I brought my MSA kids. Um, one thing that stood up to me is that um, being part of formal education, being an SGB, and also looking after a number of um, unknown or unearthed or emerging creatives, as the industry would call them, um, it's sometimes the books, the books themselves, that do not have anybody that they can relate to. And I speak from a National School of the Arts point of view where the kids are now becoming more brown and more brown. And they're reading books that historically are imprisoning their minds because they do not relate to those people. And they seeking for that freedom that you guys are talking about where they say, I want to be able to know a child's goes, from child's goes, I want to know oh mama or to the doctor DIK. I want to know that's possible, but it's not written. It's not written. Um, at the end of the day, whether they read it through a newspaper on the side of the street or they read it in a textbook, there's a school that's happening. You know, So my success is not even talking about planting beautiful pictures on a wall. You know, It's basically about building that creative mindset. If you look at the most successful countries. They start off their kids on a creative point of view, whether it be music, arts, you know. Unfortunately, in our country, the visual arts is like well behind, but so behind, you know. Even our galleries, I'm sorry, you guys. We cannot be bringing European-style gallery modes in a country that needs to empower that void, that divide, and then you still want to tell somebody 60%, 40% when that void is not even being met with skills, upbringing, you're not developing them, you know. They're not even here to learn what we're learning here, but for some of us that are here and trying to brokerage that void, we will try and, and, and bring it to them. But all I'm saying is that at the end of the day, creativity is not really about formal, informal, you know. It's about this exec panel being able to be in Alex in Soweto or in the rural areas speaking their language, where they know that it's accessible, you know, and I love what you guys are all saying, and I'm saying it is valid, but you need to bring it to the right You know what's people. crazy is when people do that, um, when, um, they work when they work with kids, kids, and then they ask the kids to draw something, have you guys worked with kids, and then they call it hard wiring, so the children will immediately just start drawing the flag. Have you ever done work with children, and they just start drawing the flag? Anyway. It was interesting for me because I used to go to Alex and do all these work with kids and they love art and you give them stuff and then everyone just starts drawing the flag like over and over. It's like this crazy propaganda thing. And then the only people they know about also is dead white people who are no longer with us and that really... So yeah, and I saw what you mean with the decolonizing of the, just the books, which is the most basic thing that people are supposed to look at and understand and we're not in it. We're not in it, so. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, one last question. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Fascinating discussion. Um, I just want to ask about the representation of the collectibles and if that would change, you know, the conversation about art in this country. Um, because I know as a semi-young black professional, how tough it is even to enter some of these gallery spaces, et cetera, where we, we want to invest, we want to acquire, we want to learn more about our local creative um, talent. And sometimes the spaces feel a little bit exclusionary. And if there was a greater representation amongst the collectibles, what that would do for you as artists in terms of your own creative process and empowerment. Hello, hello. Okay, 
The difficult is that art in itself is very elitist. It is very elitist. Um, and that's good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, um, <laughs> to myself, I apologize to myself. <laughs> it is good. It is good in a sense that when I say the it being elitist is good, is that it leaves you with this feeling that you're not like everyone else. And in art, you're not trying to, you're not trying to, with me, my responsibility is not to try and clean up my street, creatively speaking, but I'd love to, to share the light. I like the idea that the land by observing from me, I want, I'm not like a government official saying, hey, we need to do this. I don't do community building programs for my art. No. And that is very elitist. I'm very selfish with what I do, for it comes from a faraway place that most times it's difficult for me to go harvest that water. And um, no question about representation. You're a professional. I would love to learn. I assume you would love to go into the gallery space and get to learn and understand and hopefully collect. If you're a professional, Um, what we really need in this country is a number of people who are creating spaces that will exhibit art, whether it's performative art or, 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 or visual arts or writing. You guys need to create a platform. I don't mean that I'm pointing at you. In this country, what we have, there are few galleries, very, very few. There are very few spaces where artists, whether it's a musician or a dancer, I mean, we just lost the, the dance umbrella in Johannesburg, moved to Pretoria. And the problem in this country, we have so much wealth which got to be exhibited. Come this COVID-19, we have so many people have the ability to loan the state interest-free. And you look at the arts, everything is in the gutter and yet we have so much money in this country. So we need you guys, professionals, and the other men with lots of money in the darkness that we do not know the living shadows, to just come out and make the, the arts in this country work. I, I think for me, it's a, it's a bit of a complex one, because the reality is that the way that art and how people understand it as an investment how people have used it as a money laundering exercise, how people have used it as a kind of wealth um, moving thing, um, hasn't been something that a lot of black people have understood because of the fact that, I guess, we've been left out of that space of understanding um, that. So there's that problem. And then the other issue is that I feel that even though there are black professionals who are interested within the space of collecting art or wanting things that are interesting on their walls or whatever, um, we've always been in a system where what one can see and, and really monetize is what we spend our money on. So if you understand that a BMW costs you this much, even though it depreciates after the fact that you've driven it off the factory floor, that's how we understand money. So we haven't understand, understood this kind of generational space of, okay, even though today I'm not really clear what this payment will mean to, I don't know, my great grandchildren, I'm going to buy it anyway. We're, we're not in that space where we really understand um, that on a, on a very big scale. I think there are very few people who understand it and very few people who also are willing to like, share the information, if that makes sense. Uh, Please, can I, I, I want to answer, answer. Uh, answer. Uh, Sorry for Oh, so sorry. Do you know why we're not understanding it? It's what you're saying. We don't, we're not, um, how are we going to understand it if we're not being let in? I think that um, maybe I'm going to finish, finish off by saying, by saying um, the problem that I found for myself, who was in a very commercial gallery space, yes. is 
but I try to understand the gatekeeping okay. element of what the gallery does and doesn't do, which has served me on some level, but also disadvantaged me on another. So on one hand, it's amazing to have like people that are on the board of the page come to the studio and we hang out and whatever, but Joe Stoich, who's the next door neighbor, who is also somehow interested, he may not have the same amount of money, mm -hmm. but he's also interested in art, feels that he's kept out of that space. And so it's not about having people that come to the studio that are wanting to buy from the studio. It's about people who are able to say that they have access to the studio, whether it be for a glass of wine and a cup of coffee and whatever, and then they still are directed to the gallery. Doesn't happen in a way that helps people feel comfortable. Okay. So. But also, sorry, Nandi. Yeah. Also, what people should understand across the world, the visual loss, especially, is always the last thing that people think about. In this country, after '94. You know what time? We need to make dollar billionaires in FP Black. Remember? It was in paper. So remember, what do you remember? <laughs> so now we talk about the country. The arts are always left behind. You know what is my wish? If some of the black dollar billionaires can just go, for example, I'll give you one example. We have wonderful museums, national museums in this country or the multi-municipality museums, like the Johannesburg Art Gallery is one of them, we have SANG. If we were to have some of the people, I once proposed to, to Quays, what is it, I said, why don't you propose to the new, new guys, go get Mutsipe and offer in a room. Like, do away with the council running that museum because it's not working. We need you guys, fight our politics. Come on in, if you want your foot at the door, you need to go into it. It's not going to be easy, you know it. I mean, uh, but we need guys like you. We need, that's another art center. We're not discussing that. That's a center that is allowed to dwindle into its will thing through, and no one is doing a thing about it. We have vets, it's not saying a word about it. I mean, they've got their new baby to take care of. There's so many scholars here, and so many people could be saving that institution, which was donated. Thanks to Mrs. Phillips, that's all money given to the city and now is running into, into disrepair. Um, it's not gone. The buildings are wonderful at Warden Building. So if you want your foot in the door, maybe don't go into the commercial space. Leave that one. It's another ball game. That's about money. Go into places where you can really Build a shrine where all the keys who are coming up can go and learn. Because not going to the commercial spaces, yes, it's like going to a Gucci shop. But before a Gucci shop, you need a very good upkeep of the high street. The sidewalk needs to be taken out. We need people to take care of the high street. That's all I can say. Before we go to, you know, all these wonderful little things to get our, our goodies. Yes, go there, but... There's other things that are falling apart that you guys could do. I'm sorry. And What's I your name, Mama? Maruti. It's just a master so hard. I can't even identify you in my memory. memory. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so for me, um, I just want to be honest with some things that as a visual artist you encounter. For instance, you cannot get a bone. So the system itself, it makes us to move away from, you know, inviting our own people because we, we want to we wanna push our own creativity in a level where it benefits me and then I make money, I buy a house cash, for instance. So, and then the other thing, I've been encountering people that walks into my studio and manipulate my prices, you know. So if, if I say 100K for a piece of artwork, whatever, the person would want to buy that piece 50,000 rand or lesser or whatever. Then that negotiation party, that's when we start to say we're blocking the spaces, the studio spaces, because you, you're terming my mind. I'm no longer be able to create my work according to how I feel. Then I have to think about now you're bringing me this 
that I don't need. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah that vibe. But then it's not interrupting. Empty. That's the rule of the trade. Yeah. When you're trading, go to, I've never been to India, you hear stories. If you go to an Indian trader, even now they do it in Joburg. <laughs> That's the rule of trading. You go to an Indian store, Indians are good at it. If you go to India, they even go to a point of making you tea because they want you to not go out without exchanging the money for their, for their wares. So it's a hard game. If you're in a game where we have to trade, there's always negotiation. There's always manipulation. You need to understand that to be. I, listen, I, I'm 100%. Nicholas, I'm 100%. Listen, I'm 100% I agree with you. But remember that you are not dealing with that single person alone. And then that person, listen, that person will go and tell a friend, and a friend tell a friend. Then you have 10 people who are coming from, uh, to, 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 for a bargain. You know what I mean? Therefore, your, 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 your career, life, uh, life, life thing is dying because obviously everybody will come, and then tomorrow you, your voice is no longer there. You know what I mean? But I'm, that's, that's my thinking. thinking. Yes, but it is hard. Even the galleries do exactly that. I mean, this time now, you get people who want 30% discount. Um, I mean, we're not dealers. I mean, it's nice when you get to learn to do that and fend it off yourself. Um, because when the more you have a gallery, a gallery, you won't know what's happening. It's nice if you write it, you know what is happening. My grandmother was a traditional butcher. And she sold fruits and vegetables, and she ran a shipping at home. And the same thing happened, especially when it was meat. People negotiated the price. And times are like, this is what you take. If you don't want it, go away. So that's how this world operates anyway. Even in this country, they, nego they go through the same negotiations. Um, people make offers some time. OK, if you do, because at the end of the day, people want to gain. You want to gain as well. If in the process of making, I'm not saying that we should allow it, but it's a very ancient method of trading. Even when you create your own things, you trade with the idea. You push things back and forth. You decide, okay, I'm having this mark. I eliminated, I'm having that one. Sorry, I might be talking to you, but it's almost the same process of negotiating. But but we live, we live in a world, world that is driven by money, by money that and that makes it harder. If it, was if it wasn't for money, money you tell, you them, tell okay. them, OK, no, I want, no, a, fully I want a fully grown olive tree. tree. Now give, you now a give, you a give you a painting. And life, and life will be much, much better. Much better. No, no, like, like the, the days of exchange of salt for gold. No, until people realize that salt is worth nothing.